Kia ora, Robert McLaughlin here. Welcome to lecture two of week six, continuing uh, study of second order linear differential equations. Today we're going to look at this equation here. Now this equation, which describes forced stamped oscillations, is extremely important. It just turns up absolutely all over the place. And I'll give one example here where this equation comes up, but almost anything that uh, has a rest position and is stable will return to its rest position when it's disturbed or when it's forced a little bit uh, will be described by this equation. It's a very, very widely applicable differential equation. So where does it come from? It's really coming from Newton's second law, F equals ma. And if I have a, an object that can move in one dimension, and it's at position x of t, then the acceleration is going to be x double prime of t. So now I've got mass times acceleration is equal to force. So those other terms there, they describe the force and just some of the terms have been moved to the left hand side. So let's con just consider the simplest possible situation in which this equation comes up, which is a mass bobbing up and down on a spring. And if you move it from its rest position, so first I drew the rest position. Now I'm displacing it from rest by a distance x. So x equals zero is the rest position. Then Hooke's, Hooke's law of a spring is the restoring force is proportional to the displacement from rest. So the force due to the spring, now if I pull the spring down, the force is going to be pushing up, which is the way I've drawn it, it's going to be in the negative x direction. So the force due to the spring must be negative k times x, k being the constant of proportionality, k positive so that we're, in this situation here, it will that force will act to return the spring to its rest position, return the mass to its rest position. There's also going to be a damping force. And the simplest model for a damping force is proportional to velocity. So again, imagine x prime was positive. That means I'm moving down. I suppose so x is increasing. Then the damping force would act so as to slow you down. That would be pointing in the negative negative direction. So the damping force is going to be minus some constant of proportionality, which I will call gamma, times the velocity, which is x prime. Oops, I see I called it beta. There we go, minus beta x prime. So k and beta are constants. And m is the mass, which is also a constant. So m, beta, and k are three very important constants whose relative values will determine what the motion is going to do. And then the final remaining force is uh, an externally applied force. For example, you might take the, the point here and shake it up and down, or you might um, blow a fan on it or make it move in some other way, some externally applied force. So the reason this equation is so common is that almost everything in nature will obey, which uh, can experience a force, and when it's moved from rest, will experience a force like this. So for example, when you put a brick on a table, the brick is, the gravity, gravity is acting on the brick and exerting a downward force, that um, the table will move down, which we'll call the atoms in the table, to pull apart from each other, and all those little atoms, the forces between them act like tiny springs. So the table will be displaced downwards, the distance between the atoms will increase, creating a restoring force until the, the two forces are in equilibrium. 
So put that all together, you get uh, m x double prime, mass times acceleration is equal to minus beta x prime minus k x plus the external force. Move those two terms to the left and you're done. Now, the interesting thing is, what do the solutions of this equation look like? And we know how to solve it because it's constant coefficient in homogeneous equation. We know everything about it. But instead of just writing down the general solution for the general case, which would be a huge complicated formula with all those parameters in it, let's build that up through a sequence of special cases. And the simplest case is an even more important equation. It's called the simple harmonic oscillator. mx double prime plus kx equals zero. It's a constant coefficient equation, so y is going to be e to the... I can't call it m anymore because I'm using m for mass, so I'll call it lambda x. So I'm going to get m times lambda squared plus k is equal to zero. Lambda squared is equal to minus k over m. So that means lambda is going to be plus or minus i times the square root of k over m. It's the pure imaginary case. So, oops, I see it. I shouldn't have called it y, should I? x is equal to e to the lambda t. So the solution is c1 cos of root k over mt plus c2 sine of root k over mt. Now we know what those functions look like. They're periodic sinusoidal oscillations. So with no damping and no forcing, the mass on the spring will bob up and down following sinusoidal motion. For example, if I just had the sine term, literally just moves up and down like that, like a sine graph. This root k over m, that's going to be a very important parameter that's going to tell you how fast you will oscillate. This could be called the angular frequency. If that's a, if that's a large number, you're going to be oscillating up and down much more quickly. The period of these functions is 2 pi, which means the frequency, the number of cycles per second, is going to be 1 over 2 pi times the square root of k over m. And the period, the time to complete one cycle, is going to be, well, we know if I have, for example, 10 cycles per second, then the time for one cycle would, would be one tenth. It's going to be one over this number. It's going to be two pi over root k over m. Or you can write that as two pi root m over k. So if the spring constant k gets larger, that's a, the spring is getting stiffer, the period will be shorter, and the frequency will be higher. Now, what happens if I add some damping? This time the indicial equation will look like this, m, squ m lambda squared plus beta lambda plus k equal to zero. But now this is basically the completely general quadratic equation, right? And we know there's going to be three cases. It could have uh, real distinct roots, real equal roots, or complex roots. They can't be pure imaginary because that was the case when beta equals zero and we've done that one already. Now the case when you have complex roots is called the underdamped case. Recall that lambda is going to be minus beta plus or minus root beta squared minus 4mk over 2m. And if the term underneath the square root sign is negative, I'll have complex roots minus beta over 2m plus or minus i root 4m k minus beta squared over 2m. So the solution will be y, oops, keep calling it y for some reason, 
x is going to be c1 e to the minus beta over 2 mt. That's my damping part. See, it's proportional to the damping coefficient beta times cosine. My frequency is now changed. Root 4 mk minus beta squared over 2 mt. And the same thing with sines. So what happens as I turn on the damping from zero? Increases from zero. Two things happen. One is this term here causes the solutions to decay exponentially. If beta is very small, this will be a very slow decay. If beta is large, it will be a very rapid decay. And the other thing is the frequency here changes. When beta equals zero, the frequency was uh, root k over m. The minus beta squared there makes that number smaller, which means the frequency is going to decrease. The frequency will slow, the oscillations will slow down, which makes sense if you're damping something, it's not going to oscillate quite so fast. So the two effects are solutions decay oscillations decay to zero and the frequency slows. So if I sketch the solutions, instead of just oscillating, they're going to look like this. Here's the exponential decay. So that was the first case of damping but no forcing. That was the underdamped case. You're still oscillating, but not damped enough to stop the oscillations. Increase beta a little bit more. Eventually, beta squared minus 4mk will come up to zero. Then you'll have double roots. And that the root will be lambda equals beta over 2m which means the solution will be x is equal to c1 e to the minus beta over 2mt. And the second solution in the double root case, you multiply by t. So now there's no oscillations. There's a critical value of the damping. The oscillations don't just um, uh, go away gradually. They suddenly disappear at a certain value of the damping parameter beta critical value of the damping is square root of 4mk. So this solution, depending on c1 and c2, it might look something like this. Just decays to zero. Now I have exponential decay with no oscillations. What if I increase the damping even more? Now I have two real solutions. Lambda 1 and 2 is equal to beta over 2m plus or minus root beta squared minus 4mk over 2m. x is equal to c1 e to the lambda 1t plus c2 e to the lambda 2t. Now I have two exponentials, different values of the lambda here, but beta is getting bigger. So what's happening here, in the critically damped case, my decay rate was beta over 2m. Oh, sorry, that should have been uh, minus beta over 2m. My decay rate was beta over 2m. But now as beta increases further, I add a little bit to that, which means I'm going to decay more slowly. Decays more slowly than in case 2.2. So, so if you increase beta too much, you'd have very, very, very slow exponential decay. So 
depending on what the system is supposed to do, if it was a like a um, shock absorber on a car, you might not want the car to bounce up and down when it goes over a bump. You might like it to return to its rest position, but you might like it for, for, to return to its rest position as quickly as possible. That means you would design the value of beta, the, how much damping to apply, so that you were in the critically damped case. And finally, we can turn on all the bells and whistles and look at uh, damping and forcing and different kinds of forcing. Now, of course, this could get very complicated indeed. There's no limit to the interesting functions you could you know, take to the system and see what it does when you apply a forcing to it. But the most important one for us is going to be when you have a, a cosine or a sine on the right hand side. Sinusoidal forcing, that happens a lot. So, I don't want to write, it's not going to be so educational to write down complicated formulas for the solutions, but we know from solving this equation before what the solutions are going to look like. So here's the no damping case, but with uh, some cosine of alpha t. So alpha is the frequency of the forcing, or the angular frequency. And omega is the natural frequency. That's the frequency that the oscillator would oscillate at if you didn't force it. So there's two frequencies involved here. Alpha, the externally applied frequency, and omega, the natural frequency of oscillation at which that mass on the spring wants to bob up and down at. Now if alpha is different from omega, then I know what the solution is going to look like. I've got my homogeneous solution, which is going to be some cosines, and some signs. And my forcing function is a cosine. So from the method of undetermined coefficients, I would try something like a cos of alpha t plus b sine of alpha t. And in this case, the b's won't actually be present because the second derivative of cos is cos, so I only need the a term. But that's what it's going to look like. It's going to be a sum of some, some terms oscillating with frequency omega, and some other terms oscillating at frequency alpha, the frequency of the applied force. But if you change alpha so that you're forcing at frequency, forcing at resonance, then you're in that other case of the method of undetermined coefficients in which your right-hand side is a solution of the homogeneous equation. And we know that in this, well, and we know that in this case, you have to multiply the solutions by t. So the homogeneous solution will be the same. But now I have to multiply my particular solution by t. And in fact, uh, since alpha is equal to omega, I could actually just change those alphas to omega. But the qualitative nature of the solution has changed a lot. Instead of being an oscillation, it now has these terms t times cosine t and t times sine t, so it will now grow with time. Well, if you add in damping as well, you can, you can uh, tell yourself, uh, uh, work out yourself what the solution is going to look like. It's going to be a combination of the homogeneous solution that we wrote down earlier, plus some sines and cosines. So the take-home message is that usually when you apply forcing to a system of this type, the response that you will see will be what you saw in the unforced case, plus a term that looks very similar to the forcing. That occurs in case one and case three. There's one exception when this, when you're forcing at resonance, when you get completely new behavior coming out of that system.